Right. Um, good morning. Um, I'm Ginny Reyes Lamzon. I'm general counsel and chief operating officer of MCE Social Capital and one of this year's co-chairs. Thank you so much for joining us for day two of the conference. Thank you again to our program committee, to the Grinnan Center, especially Deborah Burand, Amaris White, and Lisa Ponti, and to my co-chairs, Emily Baudot and Kevin Saunders. We had around 261 attendees at yesterday's panels and presentations, an excellent turnout. The day began with an inspiring discussion with the Nobel laureate Oliver Hart, David Fridlittinger, and Kate Vitasek on a new approach to contracting and collaboration, particularly effective to help shape the complicated relationships operating in the uncertain times we find ourselves in. Our four themes gave us eight panels that have helped us articulate the problems challenges and opportunities we see daily in our practice. And we'd like to thank everyone for the very substantial and consequential discussions we had on these yesterday. Our first theme on distributive power and wealth gave us three panels that made us think about whether we as lawyers are helping spread the necessary knowledge in helping empower local players and beneficiaries. Our second theme, dedicated to understanding the trends that arose in impact investing during the times of crises, put together three panels that continued the discussion on incomplete contracting and on the evolution of contracting for impact and how the legal community has adapted to the demands of impact investing and social entrepreneurship. They also explored the new kinds of technologies that arose during these times of crises and what such new technologies pose in terms of new processes, risks, and opportunities for impact investing and social entrepreneurship. Our third theme on dynamic impact capital discussed how our colleagues are coming up with interesting new structures that allow private foundations on one panel and fund managers on the other panel to unlock, unlock more capital for impact and social investing, as well as a very helpful panel on how our, our work as lawyers can be sometimes unfairly deemed as roadblocks, but how we can rebrand as helpful parts of the solution. Our fourth theme on responding and navigating the new global regulations around impact brought us equally thought-provoking topics on the diverging regulations around ESG and impact investing, developments on impact measurement, and what it means for the legal community in this space. We also had two workshops and four table talks with themes ranging from investment mentors addressing cybersecurity breaches, nature bonds, impact measurement, establishing global legal communities of practice, and a pre presentation from law students on the state of so so social entrepreneurship and the law. We also celebrated the achievements of our community. Congratulations again to the Gavi and the COVAX project, winner of this year's Grunin Prize. For today, we are fortunate to have with us Christopher Stevens, the new Senior Vice President and General Counsel of the World Bank Group for our opening plenary session. Our four themes will continue on with their panels today, and we will also have our workshops and table talks. To cap us off, we will have what is sure to be a very inspiring closing plenary with Fran Siegel, President of the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, and Emmeline Liu, General Counsel of Calvert Impact Capital. With that, I turn you over to Am Amaris for some housekeeping notes. Thanks, Ginny. Good morning again, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Amaris White, and I'm the Executive Director at the Grenin Center for Law and Social Entrepreneurship here at NYU Law School. What an amazing first day. It was so great to chat with so many of you. It's been such an incredible opportunity to learn so much. I think my only complaint is that I can't be in two places at once because I kept wishing I could sit in in all the different sessions. Thank you again to our wonderful organizers, our co-chairs, our phenomenal speakers, and to each of you for attending. And a special congratulations to our Grenin Prize winner, Gavi, as well as all of our extraordinary finalists. Before we begin, I just wanted to remind everyone to check in and register again this morning. You can do so down the hall in Kushner Lounge where all of our food and beverages are. This is for our security team so we can get an accurate headcount and also to receive CLE credit. Speaking of CLE credit, if you are interested in receiving CLE credit, please make sure to listen for the CLE code in today's panel session. You can see um, 
all the different um, panels that will be offered for CLE code this afternoon. After the conference, you'll receive an email with a link to the Google form, and this is your CLE verification sheet wh where you will input all of your codes, and you should receive your certificates in a few weeks. Today's lunch plenary is going to be a very interesting book talk with Professor Dana Brakeman Reiser and Linda Sugan. Lunch will take place across the hall in Greenberg Lounge as well as a talk. So you'll be able to pick up your food and Kushner and then bring it over and eat during the talk. Um, if you are looking to get access to Wi Fi or program materials, you'll see the signs posted around the school. You can use the QR code to access program materials and you can use the Wi Fi login to get online. With that, I will pass it on to Amelie. Thanks, Amaris. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Chris. I have the total honor to sit here with you today and talk about your new role as general counsel and senior vice president of the World Bank Group. Briefly, by way of bio, and Chris will talk about this, I'm sure, but Chris oversees the legal vice presidency of the World Bank and a team of more than 200 lawyers globally. He's responsible for overall coordination and support on all legal aspects of the operational activities of the bank and all legal aspects of the corporate finance functions of the bank. In addition to providing legal advice on HR, procurement, IT, ethics, and external affairs, Chris was previously the general counsel and vice president at the IFC, and before that, the General Counsel of Asia Development Bank and the Managing Partner for Asia at Oric. Chris, again, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd love to start a bit with your story, how you got to where you are in this current position. This is a room of lawyers who are curious, as curious about your current role as your career path. Uh, well, thank you, Emily. It's a great pleasure to be here and an honor to uh, be among a group that's so dedicated to the uh, social impact and the sustainability and, and finding ways in which the private sector can contribute to those objectives uh, globally. Um, I very much enjoyed last night's uh, uh, festivities and uh, notwithstanding that we didn't win the uh, the award, it did go to a worthy one and that uh, we're also pleased to see uh, how many other uh, terrific prizes were considered by the group. There really is a great surge uh, in, in social responsibility and impact investing at a time when the world really needs it most. Um, so thank you for that. Thanks to Deborah. Uh, thanks to Helen. I hope this, uh, with all the uh, uh, laudits, I hope this doesn't suggest you're sending me off the way you did to Helen last night. But uh, We're welcoming you in. Okay. The community. Um, but um, my, my personal career, uh, I, I started as a private sector lawyer in New York City. I wanted to get the most rigorous, vigorous uh, training that I could possibly find. And big firm New York City seemed like a good place to go. Um, the, the uh, I guess the desk jockey's equivalent of the Marines. Um, and it was quite frenetic. It was the uh, mid 80s, decade of greed. You're too young to know what that is, but uh, go watch a Gordon Gecko movie. Um, and it really was, it was round the clock. It was 18 hour days, weekends, holidays, and the rest of it. And I thought I could do that for two years, but there were times when I wondered, it was really rigorous. Um, and, um, um, but I stayed, uh, for, for 12. Um, so, you know, the best laid plans, the, the whole thing though, uh, came to a crashing halt in, uh, on black Friday. Uh, uh, I think it was July 1, 2, uh, 1987. And so it was my first experience and the first experience of many in the market to see what a real market plunge is like. Uh, but after that, I transitioned from M&A, which came to the screeching halt into finance, uh, principally equipment finance. And then the firm said that the young partners should go out to Asia. There was a surge of Japanese investment in the United States, as many of you may recall. Uh, Japanese investors bought the Rockefeller Center here and Pebble Beach Golf Course, and they were investing throughout Asia in the Asia Tiger economies. And so send the young guy out there and uh, see what he can do. Um, and I went again, planning to go for two years to Asia. Uh, my wife said uh, it could turn out to be three, turn out to be 23. Um, and we started in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, But as soon as we got off the plane, almost literally, uh, the Asian financial crisis hit and all, all the practice and uh, leads that I had and expected to do just completely evaporated. Uh, so that was another jarring uh, uh, welcome to a new role in a new location. And so I switched back to foreign direct investment because the Chinese economy was still booming and uh, uh, joined that team. Um, and then uh, 
an opportunity some years later came up at the Asian Development Bank. And again, you guessed it, I thought I'd go down there for two years. So I took a leave of absence from the firm, stayed at ADB for seven and a half years. Um, and then the opportunity at uh, the IFC came up and I went back, uh, to, I thought that was an opportunity to come back to the US and stay involved in multilateral development. IFC was a dynamic uh, multilateral and I liked the, the focus on the private sector. Um, until about nine months ago, uh, when I took the job at the at the mothership uh, at the bank itself, and so I've been there ever since. But the story from it, I think, is the sort rather than my career is what happens just over that span of history. And I talked about the you know financial uh, uh, crisis in 1987, uh, and they you know looking over the span, they happen quite regularly. There's a catastrophe or, or economic shock that jars the world every three to five years. It was, uh, we had the, uh, uh, our firm was very heavily invested in the uh, uh, dot-coms and it was a dot-com bubble bursting after uh, 2001. There was a SARS pandemic in 2003. China joined the WTO in 2005. That had a big effect. We had the global financial crisis in 2007 and eight. And of course, uh, other interceding recessions before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Each one of these, though, is accompanied by prognostications that this is the big one. This is going to change everything. This is truly a crisis. And uh, you come to realize that the world is almost in a perpetual state of crisis. Um, and we're in the business of uh, managing those who can't manage the crisis or who are particularly hard hit by it. And so it's quite quite a challenge, quite interesting. But uh, there's little newness to it other than the, you know, the recurringness and the, just the, the urgency all the time. Thank you so much for that. And building a little bit on this theme of the poly crisis, the recurring crises and the role of the bank in particular, we know that since 2020, the poverty rate is increasing again. It had gone down a bit. Yeah. And now with the pandemic, I think I, I saw on the World Bank website, the number of people in extreme poverty, for example, rose by 70 million to more than 700 million people last year. And the bank, again, largest development bank, 189 member countries, an annual budget, operating budget of over $7 billion a year. Commitments last year, I think we spoke about this yesterday, rose to $115 billion in 2022. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about the bank and its mandate and how, how the bank is evolving today to meet the needs of our current poly crisis, which is also a theme of the conference. And Jenny alluded to that yesterday. Okay. Well, I could back up and tell you a little bit about the World Bank, unless everyone is familiar with it. Is there a, I don't want to talk about things you're already aware of or uninterested in, but if the, I could give you the 90 second uh, background on the World Bank group. There's definitely interest and I'm sure it right. could build on the knowledge. Well, the World Bank was established up at the uh, Mount Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, California, back in 1944 when 44 countries in July of 1944 decided to reorder uh, the world economic system. And the result of the Bretton Woods Conference was the creation of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Um, and, and quite audacious, uh, I would think at the time, because there were other things going on in June 1944, including a world war. And history shows that the outcome wasn't quite certain even at that time but certain enough that 44 countries decided to come together and start planning for the post-war, principally the reconstruction of Europe and the reorganization of the world economic order. Um, and so the World Bank was established um, principally at the time with a mission to reconstruct Europe. And um, it was formed with uh, um, uh, those 44 countries, but, but it's, it's, it's expanded now, it's 189 member countries each of which has shares, uh, which, which give it uh, voting power. Uh, the United States is the biggest shareholder with I think about 14.87, just less than 15% of, uh, of the share capital. Um, as an example, I think Canada has about 2.6, Brazil has about 1.6, Angola has 0 0.19, and so on and so forth around the 189 countries. And the bank operates very much as a collective, it's a, it's, a, it's a means by which countries can project their overseas development assistance and, and, and establish priorities for it and act collectively in the placement of that. 
Many countries set aside part of their budget for overseas development assistance, particularly the OECD countries. Um, France uh, contributes to overseas development assistance, I think 15 billion euro, which is about half a percentage point. Uh, the Nordics are very um, aggressive, ambitious, and generous. They're, uh, they're, they have uh, laws or even constitutional requirements to contribute 1% of their uh, gross national uh, product, uh, gross national income to uh, overseas development assistance. The United States contributes about one half of 1%, but is even that because of the size of the US economy makes the United States by far the biggest contributor to overseas uh, development assistance. Some of that is given to multilateral organizations like the World Bank. Um, and some is given on a bilateral basis where they have specific needs and would prefer to interact with countries directly and bilaterally rather than through a multinational organization. The World Bank has five separate institutions within the group. Two of them are the principal uh, public sector arm, which is uh, the World Bank uh, mothership, uh, which lends to uh, sovereign uh, states through the governments and finances government projects and initiatives and capacity building and provides advice. Uh, there's the International Development of, um, um, Association, or IDA. IDA makes long-term concessional loans and grants to the poorest of the poor. These are countries with a gross national income of less than $1,200 a year. So these are desperately poor countries, uh, often aff afflicted with uh, fragility, uh, conflict, civil wars, and, and the like. Um, and therefore have very weak systems and governance in place and are very difficult places to do, to do uh, work. Uh, and we have the International Finance Corporation, or IFC, which lends to private companies pursuing the same objectives in development. So um, across those three, um, the World Bank Group did over $100 billion last year across uh, uh, more than 1,000 projects. So it was quite a busy year. We pursue... The, the evolution, the mission has changed. We, we no longer uh, uh, target or support Europe, uh, Europe's reconstruction. In fact, um, we don't do business in high uh, income countries. We do business, the bank uh, and IFC do business in uh, uh, middle income countries principally. These are lower middle income countries with an income between uh, $1,200 and $4,000 and uh, upper middle income countries that have a, a, a gross national income per capita between $4,000 and $12,000. Uh, IDA, which is the concessional arm, works with countries that have uh, a gross national income less than uh, uh, $1,200 a year. So um, that's the span of, of operation and the objectives. And the twin goals, since we've modified the mission a few times, is to... Um, facilitate the eradication of extreme poverty, which is defined as uh, people living, uh, uh, countries where people are living on less than $1.90 a day, and to foster shared prosperity, which is living standards, environment, social, um, uh, education, and uh, uh, healthcare and the like. So that's the, that's the World Bank setup. And how is the bank evolving now? We've heard talk of the Evolution Roadmap. I think it's in the in the press or in the ethers of the impact investing community. What does that mean in terms of how the bank itself is evolving to address the needs of today? I think coming out of the pandemic was a realization that, you know, that we have a, a whole new set of uh, problems in the world. There's been um, obviously the aftershocks of the pandemic. There's been spillover effects from the war in the Ukraine. These have had you know, perpetuated and exacerbated supply chain uh, issues, uh, inflation, rising interest rates, which have created debt burdens on countries. And there are probably 25 countries that are at or near debt distress. Uh, there are countries uh, that have suspended uh, their debt service uh, on, on their sovereign obligations, which just perpetuates the problems they've already got. Um, and there are um, agricultural problems. The, um, I think Russia and the Ukraine together put out close to 40% of the world's uh, fertilizers. They supply an enormous amount of uh, grain food to uh, North Africa, exacerbating not only the immediate uh, uh, food insecurity uh, as a result of the shipments that aren't coming, but because of the uh, uh, evaporation of the fertilizer supply 
those countries and other countries that might supply can't grow their own crops and fill that gap. So we have a we have systemic problems. We've got uh, immediate and direct problems, um, and yet all of the uh, uh, the problems that preexisted the pandemic are there. The the sustainability goals were uh, uh, adopted by 193 countries in 2015. They're supposed to be achieved by uh, 2030. So 2023 is the midpoint, halfway through. And we're not going to make it. We're not even close on most of them. So we've got to uh, enough to do in our original mission. And uh, we've got a whole new range of problems. So we have to reevaluate uh, where we're going to go and how we can react to all of this. And not surprisingly, this splits the shareholders and splits the board. We don't act unilaterally in management. We're, we're under the, the guidance and supervision of our governors, which are typically ministers of finance of the various countries, including for the United States, uh, Secretary Yellen. Um, and then we have a resident board of directors. For those of you in private uh, law practice, if you deal with corporations, you know how stressful it can be to put together your semi-annual or quarterly board meeting. You can imagine if these characters were right upstairs every day. It's quite a different level of engagement, and uh, and we love we we, we love the board, um, but there's uh, they have a they have a voice, uh, and they represent 189 countries, which probably have about 150 different views, and so it's difficult for us to say we're going to do this, this, and this. We propose things to them. They're debated. They're assessed. They're sent back to uh, capitals for discussion and direction, and then we have to find out which way to go. Um, so it was interesting for us when we're trying to reassess what is the new mission, what's the new vision, what are we looking at going forward. Um, the, the the media took advantage of that discussion. Plus, we just transitioned uh, presidencies. We had David Malpass has just left uh, the bank, and Ajay Banga has just assumed office just just last week. Um, and that was an opportunity for lots in the media and the think tanks and civil society and academia. Uh, to tell us what we should be doing uh, next and best. Um, and a lot of it was just you have to do more uh, climate, you have to do more healthcare, you have to do more education, you have to do this and that and the other thing. And they're all worthy objectives. The question is, there's a scarcity of capital. With all the debt distress and calamities facing uh, the world in all of these countries today, we're, we're, we're not only unlikely to be able to do more on the basis of overseas development assistance from countries, uh, we're lucky if we can even sustain the current level. I mentioned the $104 billion we did last year, which was a massive year for us. Um, and it included $37 billion in uh, climate uh, finance, which is uh, not only our biggest year uh, ever, but 19% but ahead of target and more than the uh, G7 countries combined. But it's just a drop in the bucket. Um, and so the there was a, a group of the uh, uh, the G7 that thought that the bank should be focusing more on climate change, more on pandemic preparedness, more on knowledge. Um, and then there's a group of developing countries, most of them, in fact, that think that's all fine, but don't forget the sustainability uh, goals and the original mission of the bank. It's not the original mission of the bank, but the original mission of the bank, which is to help countries achieve uh, transportation, infrastructure, energy, healthcare, education, agriculture. Um, so it's a lot of competing priorities, and it's not as easy as, as even making that determination on our own. So we try to develop strategies and priorities, but then we have discussions with each country because we don't dictate to the country their development goals. Every country has its own ministries, its own development departments, its own finance ministries, its own uh, uh, social and political priorities for development. And we try to sit with them and determine how we can best support their development agenda. And we do that uh, through a, a discussion that culminates in a country partnership framework. And that's a three to five year plan with each country that specifically prioritizes what they want to do, how we can support uh, that, and which parts of it we can support, how they can support other pieces of it, and how other development finance institutions can support so that together we can get it done. So it becomes quite complicated, 
but uh, it's it's still a debate within our board about how we're going to allocate the capital that we have. And so we have to be creative uh, with our capital while that discussion goes. One thing is certain, though, we're not going to have a, enough capital to do everything that we want to do. And drawing on that theme a little bit more, and this conference is a mixture of private and public actors, principally um, practitioners from the private impact investing community. Yesterday, we heard about the Rhino Bond, and we're, there's a panel following this plenary on other innovative mechanisms that the bank is using to attract private sector capital. But could you tell us a little bit more generally about the World Bank Group, including the IFC, and the ways that they're thinking about catalyzing private sector initiatives? Yeah. And the role of the, the legal team in that, or the general counsel's office as well. Yeah. Well, we, we need private capital. We, we did $100 billion last year, and it's not even a grain of sand on the beach. Uh, the, the world's needs are in the trillions. And uh, at least theoretically, there's an almost infinite amount of, of, of capital available in the private sector. So how can we use and access that and deploy it to our purposes and further some of these things? And so we try to do that in a variety of, of ways um, and, and using some of the experience we've had with sovereign. So I mentioned that uh, countries set aside a, a budget for overseas uh, development assistance. And if, um, if Sweden sets aside a, 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 a budget uh, allocation and they want to focus on uh, Sweden is always very focused on uh, climate and gender. If they want to do a gender related project in uh, uh, Angola, they don't have uh, access or knowledge or people or facilities in Angola. So they might park that money with us. Maybe we put it in a trust fund and we can deploy that money because we have people, we have economists, we have lots of economists. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we've got economists. Uh, but we've in the analytics, we've got the uh, uh, compliance people, we've got the relationships, we have people who are uh, tasked with understanding the government and whatever sector is relevant there. And so using those same ideas in the in the public, uh, uh, in the private sector, uh, we try to identify different potential sources of funding in the private sector and see how we can harmonize that uh, and put it to use for these goals. And the, the bond uh, market is one creative way. I don't know if you're familiar with some of the bond things, but it, you, uh, I think the World Bank pioneered the green bond in 2008. And you, you're trying to build on these things. The first one is always the most difficult to do, part because it's never been done, part because uh, uh, in all candor, public institutions are somewhat risk averse uh, and, and new things don't come easily. We like precedent, we like established ways of going, but the world doesn't seem to uh, uh, wait for us always and, and uh, things seem to come at you. But once we do one, you acquire knowledge and you can be able to do the second one and ultimately you can start uh, facilitating uh, other people uh, doing that. So in the bond market, just this year, we were able to do uh, help India with a uh, $2 billion uh, green bond initiative. We helped Vietnam do a uh, emissions linked uh, bond that helped finance the uh, uh, placement of water systems in several thousand schools. Um, we've done uh, uh, in Chile, we did an earthquake bond. Um, and if we can, we can figure out if we can find a pot of money somewhere or a source of money somewhere, whether it's a stream coming in on a loan or there's a carbon credits or there's a, a trust fund or someone's willing to pay for somebody for something, there's, there, there's got to be a way we can put to, uh, together a link to translate that to translate that and to support some social initiative on the ground. Um, and that's really the uh, where, where the job becomes quite challenging and then the role of the lawyer can become quite interesting. We also um, try to build uh, systems where we uh, bring in uh, private sector into projects in countries they wouldn't ordinarily be in. We're, we're by definition almost, we're dealing in some of the most challenging places to do business in the world. In fact, if the private sector could do the projects that the bank or IFC supports, then we shouldn't do it. I'm not saying we don't do it because we're looking for business and, but, uh, but but if the private if 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 a uh, project has the economic fundamentals the operational uh, fundamentals and the credit uh, sufficiency to attract an HSBC or a Citibank uh, then we shouldn't be doing it. 
But sometimes it takes uh, a little bit of a nudge for us. It takes us taking de-risking some of that, uh, not just by giving an old-fashioned guarantee, but through structuring. Um, we can we can uh, uh, not only introduce some of the private sector funding into developing countries, but we can acquaint them with a new jurisdiction, a new business, and hopefully they can take it beyond the project and start to do more uh, business there. The ultimate objective in all of this, though, is to lift the country and its capacity so that it becomes less reliant on uh, development finance assistance. I mentioned uh, Ida earlier, which is the uh, concessional arm dealing with the poorest of the poor. Over the uh, uh, 55 years, I think, of Ida, 36 countries have graduated out of Ida assistance, and some of them have become donors back to Ida. Uh, donors because Ida gives money away in terms of grants or makes long-term concessional financing. And so uh, it will never be self-sustaining. It needs to be replenished. We have to go back to the um, Ida, Ida participating donor countries every few years on bended knee. And we say, uh, you know, the United States, you've got to put in uh, uh, $10 billion. And they'll say, no, and we'll say, please. And they'll say, how about two? And we'll say seven. And so it goes. And then we go to France. And then so it's quite a tedious uh, and, and long process. Thank you so much. I'm going to open it up to the audience in just a moment. But President Bonga is obviously known to this community, his pioneering work in impact investing when he was the head of MasterCard, particularly on climate and inclusive growth. Given your deep background in development finance as well, do you see this role of innovative finance for the bank growing under this new presidency and this new your new leadership as well? Yeah, I think so in a couple of different respects. Um, you know, different personality, different experience. Um, Ajay comes from the private sector, the first private sector leader of the bank we've had since Wolfenson. So that's quite a different lens and approach, mentality. Um, and it's a little suggestive of the different mindsets between public and private sector generally. Why isn't it easier to pull the private sector into uh, uh, public uh, work? And it's because the two worlds really are uh, quite different. Uh, but uh, I, I've met with him probably a dozen times over the last few months during his transition. But the uh, day before yesterday, we had our first uh, senior management team leading, uh, meeting, and he came in with a whole agenda. Uh, and, and very heavily on sustainable development, um, uh, the concept of, a, of, of creating a livable planet, not just economic development, but emphasizing the sustainability, durability, and resilience of country systems. Um, and in the climate specifically, he was talking about uh, backing something we're wringing our hands about, which is uh, climate resilient um, uh, debt clauses. These are clauses that uh, have been pushed very hard by the United Kingdom, principally with the Caribbean nations uh, in mind, that uh, in the Caribbean, some countries are very heavily impacted by uh, hurricane seasons. Uh, they used to call them hurricane clauses. And these are so devastating to the economy that they paralyze the, uh, uh, the economy and the government's ability to pay its debt. And so the idea is to have a, uh, a clause in the sovereign obligation that would pause the, uh, uh, the the requirement to make debt service payments for some period of time, whether it's eight months, 12 months. Uh, this thing is traditionally abhorrent to uh, MDBs. Uh, we uh, we encourage and participate in debt restructurings when, 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 when Ghana, or Tanzania, or Sri Lanka is in debt distress, but we do not restructure our obligations. We're not an aid agency. If we make a loan, we need the money back. Um, we rely on our uh, sovereign credit rating, which is AAA, and we got a AAA credit rating in 1959, and it is precious. It enables us to go into the capital markets. All these shareholders I mentioned, these 189 shareholders, have paid in capital of $20 billion, which we have leveraged into $800 billion of projects. And we do that by issuing bonds. And with the AAA credit rating, and I'm making these numbers up, we can issue a, a bond at you know, two and a half percent. Um, and then we can turn around and lend it uh, to countries that have very poor credit and would lend at astronomical rates, but we can lend it at 3.2%. Uh, we have to preserve that or we become uneconomic to deal with. Uh, and the rating agencies, when they give a AAA credit rating, and by the way, that is so rare these days, I think the United States itself is on credit watch 
uh, and was downgraded in, in, in 2011, the last time they had this sort of shenanigans going on uh, down in our neighborhood back in Washington. But if you want to find a bond at J.P. Morgan, I think it's double A. Uh, Goldman Sachs is double A. So triple A is really the top of the top, but it's always a bit precarious. S&P is constantly in our office looking at operating systems, policies, compliance, uh, strategy. They look at portfolio and diversification. And remember, our portfolio is comprised of, of, of receivables from some of the worst credits in the world. So to have a AAA uh, credit rating is, is, uh, is quite important, but quite hard to achieve. And the other thing they look at is our so-called preferred creditor status. And that's not written anywhere, but it's a practice that if and when a country does restructure, it exempts multilateral uh, development agencies. So all the creditors fly into uh, to, to Ghana, which they're currently doing. Uh, and it's called the Paris Club. And they get together and you've got all the lenders uh, who traditionally lend sovereign credits to Ghana. And they talk about how to restructure the debt so that Ghana can manage the payments and recover. Uh, we do not restructure. And, that, and that's because of, we are a preferred creditor. So they have to continue to pay us. We're not subject to their moratorium and we're not subject to their uh, debt, uh, uh, debt forgiveness or an extension of the term or the reduction in, of, of the rate. And as unfair as that sounds, if we were to fiddle around in restructurings, particularly given our portfolio, Standard & Poor's would downgrade us immediately. Uh, and then we'd have to borrow in the capital markets at a much lower rate. Um, so it's uh, that's the reason for it, but it's not a not a not a easy story to tell or one that's well understood. And given your that rating and given the preferred creditor status, to have the climate resilient debt clauses is it? I mean, it's a pretty big deal and a pretty a demonstration of the evolution of the bank's approach to contracting and baking in more flexibility and relational contracting and the power of the contract. I feel like has come back to this conference in a fantastic way. So that is. When you asked about the role of the lawyer, too, because initially the role of the lawyer says, no way, you can't do that, yeah. right? It's just to throw up every red flag and obstacle because <laughs> that's what we do best, right? We see shadows, we see monsters under every bed, and uh, uh, and that's what we're good at. But, but you know, increasingly the role of the lawyer is to facilitate and find a pathway forward to be able to accomplish the mission of the bank. And to your point on the, uh, uh, the the principles we're trying to achieve, rather than just looking at that and letting the uh, the boogeyman from Standard and Poor's and Moody's uh, come in and frighten us, we have to you know push that envelope as as far as we possibly can. Thank you so much. I could I could keep going. I'm loving this conversation, but I'd love to open it up to the audience to ask some questions. Carl, please, and I'll take a few if I can, and then um, ask Chris to answer a couple at once. So, yeah, please let up. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. I'd like to ask about the role of China, uh, which you didn't mention. Um, China has rightly or wrongly viewed the World Bank Group as U.S. dominated or G7 dominated and has formed its own development banks as a counter to the World Bank Group. And by current reports, is one of the largest holders of public and private debt. And I'm curious how the World Bank Group is responding to the competition in the new role of, of China as a provider of debt and development assistance. Thanks, Carl. Other questions? Yeah, there are a few at once. Please. And actually, could you introduce yourself as well? And go behind. Yeah, I, I'm you. Rachel Robbins, former general counsel at IFC. Uh, Chris, could you talk more about what IFC does to entice the private sector? You touched on it. But if you could talk more about some of the de-risking techniques using blended finance and other, and, and maybe give some examples of some innovative ways and also address the performance standards, how that comes into investments. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel. Mary Rose, please. Thank you. Mary Rose Bruce-Witt's partner at Clark Hill. Kind of continuing what Rachel's question was, in terms of, we were talking a lot yesterday about relational contracting and establishing frameworks of how to align interests and in your case, it's it's very challenging to align the private sector, the governments, the bank, et cetera. Do you see, especially under the new management, new techniques coming into play? And are there ways that we could develop principles for um, alignment changes, especially because of the incidence of crises that seems to be increasing? Thank you. One more, sure, please, Maria. 
Hello, Maria Santos Valentin at the Ford Foundation. Um, I'm curious, since this is a conference on impact investing, what do you think about impact investing? Is that something that the World Bank sees itself doing, being a part of, supporting in some way? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Good. Thanks. So on, on four at once. <laughs> We are trying to find ways to engage with China. It's uh, it, it's a challenge in some cases because it's just different culture, different business practices, different strategic objectives associated with it. But as you point out, they are an enormous bilateral creditor. One of the tensions we have, and just using Ghana for an example, uh, they're a big bilateral creditor into Africa. Uh, but because it's bilateral, they're part of the Paris Club and should be restructuring their debt. They view themselves as being able to be either exempt for that or take. So there's that discussion about how they participate. So they're not formally part of the Paris Club. Yet because they're so large, it makes little sense for Ghana to restructure its uh, uh, foreign debt obligations with the Paris Club and all the member countries that have loaned through, through uh, uh, bilaterally and, and not include China. The other challenge we have is transparency. They don't uh, disclose some of the uh, debt or the terms. They don't uh, disclose other related agreements that are uh, associated when they provide a loan. There might be a tangential agreement over here on minerals or natural resources. And one of the things, particularly under former President Malpass, he has been talking about debt sustainability for 25 years. And this for him is absolutely essential to, a, uh, to, to economic uh, security. Uh, and it starts with transparency. And so we've had a big push to try to uh, uh, bring transparency and sustainability into that. In the legal department, we have just uh, virtually on, on uh, David Malpass's uh, last week, um, I, I got him to approve a proposal to permit us to form within the legal group a law reforms and judicial capacity building unit to help countries directly uh, 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 with laws that uh, strengthen their uh, economic pathways, social uh, development, and to help judiciaries become more effective and efficient in their operations. And, uh, uh, and one of the things we're starting to do in Sri Lanka is to help them with a model debt transparency and debt reporting law so that we can help in their uh, uh, recovery, but uh, that will come with strings attached. We also have a mechanism, which is a development policy loan, rather than just building roads and electricity facilities and helping with healthcare facilities. Uh, we make loans to poor countries for uh, uh, in, in, on the basis of what we call prior actions. We will give Pakistan $200 million, but they have to do these 12 things. And uh, that would include law reforms, regulatory reforms, policy initiatives, um, and then the, the and, and, and active reporting and monitoring to make sure that they achieve those results. Um, but we think that uh, China can productively participate in a lot of this. Um, and, and, and as far as the politics go, our articles prohibit us from taking political considerations into account. And that was put in at Bretton Woods in 1944 much at the request of developing countries, some of which had their own systems or political governance, or maybe they were authoritarian regimes, and they didn't want to join an international organization whose mission it was was to overturn their system or to throw them out and put in what the West... So um, there is a, a little bit of a hesitancy to uh, bring in politics, but of course it's impossible. The you know, the Chinese have their own director at the board. The U.S. has its own director in the board. All the Europeans are there. To the Chinese point that these institutions are Western dominated, it's an absolute certainty. It's uh, there's no denying it. Both at the IMF um, and at the uh, at the World Bank. But uh, we hope that they, they, they we're we're looking for for competence in management rather than political. And we do. And one of the roles of the lawyers is to try to steer the conversations and decision making away from the, the politics of it. Um, on the private sector and de-risking, um, to Rachel's point, uh, IFC does blended finance. So this is rather new in the last 10 or 15 years. And this is the, the ability of the use of IDA funds. I mentioned that IDA is the arm that, that provides uh, either grants or long-term concessional funding to the poorest of the poor. 
And so the practice in Ida is to make money almost freely available, but, but very inexpensively available. And yet IFC also is dealing in fragile and poor countries and can be expensive. Um, and so to either de-risk or to make it less expensive, we can blend some Ida. Uh, we created a window within Ida for use by the private sector to either de-risk a, a part of a private sector loan or to uh, uh, make it less expensive. And so there are ways that can blend uh, that. In terms of engaging the private sector, we can do that on the uh, project by project basis or through the sorts of things you're discussing here. Um, at the onset of the pandemic, it became clear there was a real vaccine distribution problem in the developing world. You remember the first vaccines were thought to be required to, to be maintained at some super low temperature, which made distribution in Africa, Asia, Latin America, virtually impossible. Even if you could get quantities of vaccine, which were being gobbled up, gobbled up by the OECD countries, but even if you could get them as Gavi was, was doing and we were working with them, um, it was we didn't have the transportation uh, infrastructure in place. So the shift uh, uh, initially after the pandemic has been pandemic preparedness. It is, the economists will tell you, but you don't need an economist to tell you, it's a lot less expensive to invest in pandemic preparedness than it is to wait and respond to a pandemic while people are dying. So we brought a, a vaccine manufacturer from India. India has the largest uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, capacity probably in the world. It's also uh, responsible for, I think, 20, 25% of the generic uh, drugs in the world. Some 60,000 pharmaceuticals uh, uh, in the generic line are, are come out of India. And so with that experience, technology, capacity, we uh, uh, helped them establish uh, vaccine manufacturing and pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities in Senegal and in Kenya. We worked with uh, Institut Pasteur out of France to try to set up a vaccine uh, uh, facility in, uh, in Africa. Um, so that's one way of supporting it because we can provide financing, um, but we can also impose leverage uh, our own standards into a private sector transaction. So if we were uh, uh, last year, we supported a pan-Africa pan, uh, telecommunications uh, project to bring digitalization to Africa. It's absolutely critical for the 20th century uh, to digitalize education, healthcare, um, uh, medical services, police services, um, and to be able to run the economy efficiently. And yet it's an astonishingly, audaciously, almost ridiculously difficult project to run a, a digital system through Africa. But with our assistance, we can navigate a lot of those. We can offset the risk and then and we can finance it. So we give technical assistance and advisory on how they can accomplish it. And then we provide money. The strings attached are you have to run these digital services into outlying or tribal communities. You have to go to uh, underserviced or, or uh, uh, normally excluded outlying uh, part, portions of the community. You have to go and support uh, women-owned businesses which struggle for uh, resources. Um, and you have to comply with our environmental standards. So we're not easy to deal with, but we, we try to nudge these uh, standards into projects at a project by project basis in the hope that ultimately they will become market practice, whether it's environmental, social, anti-corruption, procurement um, systems. Um, new principles in crisis and systems. Um, it's interesting, we talk about evolution and evolution is a critically important concept. I mentioned the uh, uh, IBRD was set up in 1944 to refinance, uh, the, the, to finance the, the reconstruction of Europe. And our first loan was to France. And now, you know, France doesn't qualify for a loan, um, but we're still doing a lot of that reconstruction work. And initially through the 60s, 70s, 80s, a lot of the work re, uh, was, was had to be done uh, with our money and we would require them to comply with our rigorous environmental and social standards. And so we looked at ENS as a project risk and we would try in our financing of an operation 
try to identify what is that risk, how can it be mitigated, what's the plan for mitigation, make that a covenant and a loan agreement, make them report on it and monitor it. Now we've evolved from using ENS as a risk factor to it being an objective. Now we're financing the advancement of economic systems that, that make uh, environmental and social uh, objectives a, a one of the development priorities. And that requires a whole different level of specialists and economists looking to strengthen systems because in the developing world, one of the biggest challenges in addition to all the rest of them is the weak institutions, uh, weak capacity. Um, and so it really starts there. If they're going to become self-sustaining uh, and on a livable, uh, sustainable, durable, resilient basis, they have to have the systems to be able to do it. So increasingly we're doing the sorts of things that, uh, that, that are being discussed over these couple of days. And we've moved from ENS as a risk factor on a project basis to a, a development objective on a systemic basis. Um, what was Maria's question? Oh, impact investing is, is sorry. The whole conference, what do I think of this conference? Terrific conference. It's critical. It's critical because, you know, I mentioned all the many, many, many things that, uh, that, we, that we do and work with and all the pressures and voices at the table, which can come sometimes be, be, be lead to, to either uh, slow evolution or paralysis. And it's vitally important to have uh, voices like yours who are focused on impact investing to keep pounding that uh, to us so that we are responsive to it. Civil society generally plays an enormous role in our work. Um, and, and they're a critically important voice at the table. Uh, and, and I think it's like, uh, you know, we're not regulated. Uh, we, we, have, we have shareholders and we have other influences, but it's critically important to bring that voice to bear. And it's, in, and it's particularly useful when you have an expertise and an objective that is, uh, uh, furthers ours, but, it, but brings a different perspective to it. So it's, it's vitally important and we support it wholeheartedly. Thank you so much. I think sadly we are at time. Um, but Chris, you have given us such a rare window into the bank itself, into the legal practice within the bank. You've touched on so many of the themes we talked about yesterday and are talking about today. And it's been personal privilege and honor. And on behalf of the program committee chairs and the entire program committee, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. The honor has been mine. So keep up the good work and thank you for having me.